Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Daybreak, brand new show on Netflix. Chris Rodriguez here to talk about it. Hi. Nice to meet you. You too. How's everything going? Great. Feels yeah. like a pretty good time for you right now, Yeah, right? I'm having a great time. That's awesome. I have a lot of cool things coming up at the same time, and this is one of them that I'm really proud of, so it's great to be able to talk about it. What do you think about when you see yourself right now? It so? makes me laugh. <laughs> Why does it make you laugh? <laughs> because I don't, I don't see me you in don't, that. You don't even see yourself. No, here. I see, like this ridiculous character and I'm like I did I did something like that that's so weird <laughs> so you just like totally get into that character you lose yourself like, totally, how, how do you yeah. make that happen I mean it's not like in like a, a method you know way it's just you have to be willing to go there mm -hmm. at any moment and you have to be willing to like get dirty literally figuratively <laughs> like get on the ground I would like lick blood off the mm. dirt like you know there's those are new experiences new experiences for me and you just have to like put it all aside so the person you are who might blanch at the idea of that mm -hmm. has to go away and so this other thing that is totally willing to go full out comes out and that's that's who that person is right there <laughs> so what are the biggest challenges in going for it and nailing that every single day playing that character yeah, it, I was I was concerned when mm -hmm. I first got the show that I was how I was going to be able to s sustain that, um, but it it was so clearly written, and I think that part of what we find later on is that she has a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. So I knew that before. So to be able to realize that the things that were happening were actually her piecing together parts of her life, that it's all groundwork that's being laid was helpful for me to find the honesty in it. And then from that point on, you just got as goofy as you could get. And <laughs> like, I, can't, I always say this, like, no one was ever like, okay, whoa, that was They weren't too far. like trying to push no you back or anything. Stopped they me. wanted more of anything, I'm sure. Like. <laughs> yes, and sometimes I was like, I, I hope that I am not like, I always was joking that I was going to be the Jar Jar Binks of Daybreak. <laughs> that, like, it was just going to get so out there that everyone was going to be like, the, what is this? But people seem to respond really well to her. She's somewhat relatable, even though she's sure. totally insane. Yeah, there's those universal connective points. It's just like, it's really freeing to just kind of let loose totally. and do something that's totally different from who you are in real and life. And that's what the apocalypse in this version yeah. of the show is about, is reinventing yourself. Mm. And like, where she was a bit of a doormat in the pre-apocalypse, now she is the loudest one in the bunch and like the most animalistic taking control of situations and like and being feared and mm. listened to and and cared for all the things that she didn't get to do before so that's sort of yeah what's what's really relatable about her yeah I think. it's cool because like with identity we don't always get the opportunity to just like totally start over yeah. like that yeah totally from the ground up and and this isn't like if you were handed this version of starting over, you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> be like, psyched I mean, about honestly. it, <laughs> you know. But um, but she she meets these people that encourage her and 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 shape her moving forward, and and that's what she always wanted. That's awesome. Yeah. So, what's been the most interesting part of this experience for you? Um, I think part of, part of what was interesting is that um, you know I'm one of the only adults mm. in the show, and uh, that means that to this point in my career, there has been a lot of similar roles for women above a certain age. Sure. And I was getting very frustrated with them and was very bored <laughs> by it. And this came up and it was the most surprising thing to me that this was the ane antidote to mm. that sort of experience was this crazy character who gets dirty and, and, and takes up space it I, I didn't realize that I was frustrated with like men always getting to kind of behave badly and women being like hmm you know right, tunk, it's, tunk, a, it's tunk. a BS yeah. double standard yeah, yeah 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 but but not it's not even it's just that like that part is out there those that role is out there that is a thing that's real this is not out there right. yeah. you know and so to be able to be like oh I get to do something completely different lose myself entirely in it and be somewhat like the feminist hero mm -hmm. of the, of the like, story. This is dope. Yeah. It was dope, yeah. yeah. So that was a big surprise. I did not expect that. Even going out to Albuquerque mm -hmm. to shoot it, moving my whole life, being like, I'm gonna go spend some time with some teenagers and be the only adult. I'm not gonna know anybody or relate to anybody. And it turns out like there are some of now my best friends mm -hmm. and they're some of the best actresses, actors and actresses I've gotten to work with. And I got to play this character that really kind of changed my life and the 
trajectory of where I want to go with my roles. That's awesome. So what was most surprising about spending so much time with teenagers? What would you pick up from I that? have no idea what they're saying. And I, I think <laughs> it's like what, a whole foreign language. It, it's a total foreign language. And I was most surprised that it was that way. Because I thought I was pretty hip. Yeah. I thought I was yeah, like, you thought you were with it, right? I'm pretty cool. I'm yeah. not that old, you know. I'm, not, I'm no one's mom sure. or anything. But like, yeah, they just started talking. And I was like, oh, no, it's happened. It's happened. It's, like, it's like a whole different world, it, right? Yeah. yeah. And and I'm used to, used to being the youngest in things. So were you intentionally just skipping out on some stuff because you're just like, I'm, I'm out on this? Yeah. Yeah, I took, I took almost a full year um, to get really super specific about what I decided to do. And I feel really proud of the things that have cropped up from that. Yeah. It was a it was a year of not working a lot yeah, and what that's was that very like for scary. You? It's scary yeah. and tense. There's, you know, money mm -hmm. like concerns and all kinds of things and you want to do stuff that fulfills you, but it's hard to feel fulfilled when you can't eat. Yeah. So it, it's a scary thing and I'm I am pleased and relieved at how it has shaped and turned out, but it has it sort of led to this season that I'm in right now of doing a lot of different incredibly diverse roles that I feel satisfy a lot of different um, urges that I've wanted to act on and um, and it and it feels really great so I, I'm proud of that work that had that I had to do but it's it, not to say it will last forever sure. either but you know, those are the decisions you have to make. Yeah, I give you credit for just pushing pause and having agency over your own career. Right. Because I'm sure you were just like, I gotta work, right. I gotta eat, but you at the same eat. time, I wanna do stuff that fulfills me. Right, right, and it's a hard balance. And you also don't know what will fulfill you. Right. Especially on a TV show, you don't know what the seventh or eighth or ninth script is gonna be, mm -hmm. 12th season is gonna be like, it could end up being something that's really fulfilling and then end up feeling like what we call golden handcuffs, mm. where it's like a, something so great, right. you don't want to you you shake leave. your life yeah. up, you know? So so there is a lot of different things where you just don't know, and, and, and if we all had a crystal ball, life would be so much easier, <laughs> but <laughs> we don't, sure. and we figure it out as we go. I mean, to go from like barely working one year to being on a Netflix show, yeah. which is worldwide, like that must blow your mind it at times, does. right? It really does, yeah. Well, and, and being an actor always, it's a phone call away from your yeah. life going up or down immediately. It's and crazy. You, you wait, how long do I wait before I give up on what my belief is here? And then that phone call happens and you're like, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But that also doesn't always happen. Yeah, so. I hear you. How about yeah. the theater thing? It's obviously been a big part of your life. When did yeah. you get the theater bug, and what's it been like exploring that world? Oh for you? boy, the theater bug came when I was six. Yeah, it, it was really it young. It was for very you, right? early. Yes, it was um, what I like to call Annie destroying lives. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like destroying lives since 1977. Mm. Um, I saw Annie, and that was and it. You were hooked. I was done, yeah. and and I was done in my heart, but I didn't know what that meant. And I knew I liked singing, and I was like, maybe I'll be a singer. But in my mind, that was just a pop star, which mm -hmm. was not appealing to me at all. And, uh, but I always had that love for theater, but never really understood that it was a career until I was about 12 or 13. And then that's when some, my mom actually told me. She was like, you know, people do this for a living. And like, oh. I, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, Let's here get it going I am, right like, now. nothing else mattered. <laughs> and I was, I did my first Broadway show when I was 19. So wow. between 13 to 19, I was just like, don't anybody stop me. This is what, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> this is what's happening. Yeah, and it was because, and also I, I came, to, I grew up in Southern California. Mm -hmm. I came to New York and, um, I saw like eight Broadway shows in eight days. It wow. just like went all over the place. And I saw a show and I saw the woman come out and sign autographs and then she put her hat on and just disappeared into Times Square. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Like, this is really cool. Yeah, it's yeah. like you get to do the work, you're honored for the work, and then nobody cares about you. Yeah. <laughs> like and you can five just seconds blend later. In. Yeah. yeah. And and it was so um, refreshing. And that's what I was missing when I was imagining my life as a pop star was mm. like this idea of having to like be a, a persona all the time. Right. You that, know? That's exhausting. It's you exhausting. And I knew that, that at 12 years old, right. which is crazy, but you know, there is something to be said for now this outreach we have with fans and the mm. way that they sort of um, dictate now what gets seen in right. a way that they didn't before. Yeah. So it is nice to be able to have that connection now and sort of get get your voice out there, but, um, but yeah, there was something really appealing about that anonymity. Mm. You know. It's a nice thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah.
What was your uh, favorite memory from that first show when you were 19? Oh gosh, well that show was, <laughs> I, was in a, I was in a flop, like a very big notorious flop. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't, it didn't like lend to many great experiences. It's quite a way to start your career. It's quite a way. It's a punch to the gut. Yes, and also I was what's known as a swing, okay. which means I'm not in the show all the time. I'm ready to go on for someone if gotcha. they get sick or go on vacation or whatever. And so my, my actual Broadway debut was the second performance of the show, someone got food poisoning at mm. dinner, <laughs> and I went on with 30 minutes notice oh in a show that was not finished with no rehearsal. So they were like running around, like telling me, like, okay, and then you run here, and then you, you grab this prop and you give it to so and so, and then you walk over there, and they were like fitting costumes on me. They they literally like we ran out of time. They pushed me on stage. <laughs> and Sounds I like a nightmare. It was a nightmare. No one was in the audience. Like my parents didn't get to come. Like oh. no, it was just this like crazy experience. And I remember I started up like facing up stage and being like, this is the worst. Like this is the <laughs> stupidest job. Who made up this job? Who would sign up for Who's this? Who decided it was okay to like make somebody do a Broadway show with no rehearsal at 19 years old? So that was kind of a mess. Um, but my second show was Spring Awakening, the mm -hmm. original cast, and that was almost two years to the day in the same theater. Oh wow! And it just like quite a different could story. not have repaired my you know Broadway aspirations more. It was such an amazing and beautiful experience. So That's that awesome. I only have amazing memories right. of. It's all part of the journey. It you know? is. And I'm I'm grateful that I started that way because I could appreciate Spring sure. Awakening. But damn, like first Broadway show. And <laughs> Out the like... gate. I was like, well, I guess I'm going to quit. <laughs> I really was. I was yeah. like 19. I'm hanging up my hat and we're like, done right, with cool, Broadway. Cool, time to get a real job, yeah. like salary benefits. Like, yeah, I sense. went back to school. Yeah. I was like all, all in to, to quit. But... Funny how things can change real it, quick. It can, you know? yeah. That's the theme, I guess. <laughs> it all changes. Definitely. So you've yeah. done a lot of different things in your career. What have been some of the proudest moments for you? Like people you've worked with, stuff you've done. Like what sticks out to you? I always say I have like I have the best TV dads mm. or like or work dads. Yeah. Like Nathan Lane got to, was my father in um, Adam's Family, and I got to be his daughter, and that's it was great. one of the best experiences. He was just a master to watch and to work with and to to get that sort of um, father-daughter relationship was really special. Mm. And then on Trial and Error, I got to work with John Lithgow as yeah, my father, yeah. and he is also just the menchious of menches. Like, he's just so great and a genius. And um, so I've loved, like, getting to work with these people on such an intimate level and to see people that I've admired growing up. Like, that's really the... A lot of it you can sort of get numb to, mm -hmm. but the working with the people that you have pictures with at the stage door when you're 10, yeah. like, that's always a pinch me moment that never gets old. That's really cool. Yeah. So what are some other things you'd like to still do if you haven't done yet? Oh my gosh. Um, I find that I really, like, enjoy doing things where I get to have a collaborative uh, voice. Mm -hmm. and, and in theater especially, you get that just because there's the same people in the same room working on the same thing. Right. Television's a bit more disparate. People are in LA and they're in New York and they're working to make a TV show from all areas and there's hundreds of people putting it together. Um, so theater is already collaborative at its core, but I would love to, I'm starting to um, try my hand at producing cool. and making content and um, you know, I, people are always, when I would get dissatisfied with roles that I was seeing, they'd be like, you should write something. Mm -hmm. and, and I never felt that. And right. I, I felt almost like um, embarrassed to say that I just wanted to be an actor. Like, There's something embarrassing yeah, about that. Yeah, but it was like, it felt like, oh, I, d I, I guess I'm not like a good, you know, t go getter or whatever. I'm not going to write my. And then it took me a second to be like, actually, I think producing and acting is, is mm -hmm. actually where I want to be because. I love having input, and I love tweaking things like that people have created and saying, I know how to make this better. I know how to um, streamline this or, or take, get, it to the next level. take it to the next yeah. level. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of how I have developed that muscle, and so I'd like to be doing a lot more of that while continuing to act. I'd just like to produce things so I can be in them too. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Who are some other people who maybe do acting and producing that you look to and you're like, I like what that person's doing. Oh, this gosh. is great. Reese Witherspoon is like yeah. killing the game on yeah. that. 
she and she was one of the first too. I mean, yeah. you know, she was on the forefront of it, and her production company is like Type A Productions. Like mm. she was like, I am grabbing <laughs> this industry by here. the gonads yep. and like <laughs> going for it. And so she's really astonishing to watch in that way. Um, you know, people like Amy Poehler and mm -hmm. Tina Fey, they were bosses before women were bosses, totally. you know? And, yeah. and that's, um, and reclaiming that. I mean, Tina's book is Bossy Pants. Mm -hmm. Like, she's like, here I am. Yeah, my wife read it. She's like, yeah, this is great. Right. Yep. It's like, I am going to be the boss, and yep. you have to get on board with Deal that. Deal with it, and exactly. And this, this play that I'm doing right now, I'm doing the, a play off-Broadway called Seared, and I mm -hmm. played the boss. Mm -hmm. And she gets a lot of flack for being the boss just by the sheer fact that she's wearing high heels. Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, she's going to be bossy. It's like, well, yeah, I'm your boss. <laughs> I'm the boss. doesn't <laughs> yeah, matter what I'm wearing. Turns out yeah. that's what a boss does. Yeah. So um, so I've, I've really admired the women who have sort of claimed that as a positive and been unapologetic while they plow through this industry that's very hard to do. Yeah, that's what you have to do because there's going to be a lot of crap you have yes. to deal with, but you just have to you keep pushing keep through, pushing. create yeah. more opportunities, create new voices because otherwise like things remain the same and we, totally. we can't have things remain the totally. same. Totally. Why would we? Yeah. we we're going to all get bored if that happens. Exactly. Yeah. Just like you were bored. Um, we can't yeah, have that happen again. Can't, can't be bored, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it going. So yeah. when people check out the show, what are the big things you want them to be thinking about? Um, gosh, there's so much about it. It's so... The, the world is so e expansive. Mm -hmm. Like, we created a new world from scratch, and that is in large part to the writers, obviously, and the directors, but the designers yeah. and the, the costumes, the props, the set design, everything is so meticulously from the ground up. They created brand new groups of people and I, I was always just enthralled I mean you can see some cheermazons in the back yeah, there like see them there. they're <laughs> unbelievable and like uh, we have a samurai and a girl in a cape <laughs> like and a witch it's yeah. like all of these people just came together and I, I think what I'm most proud about the show is how it talks about well yes there is there's some violence there is some like learning curve with now 18 and unders sure. running the world but um they come together very quickly, and what I'm proud about the Daybreaker tribe specifically is that the other tribes are sort of um, homogenous. They're mm -hmm. who they hung out with in the pre-apocalypse. The the Daybreakers are like different cultures, different languages, different backgrounds, different clubs, different ages. All of them come together to do what the impossible, and mm. that's like try to create a world that is better than the one they were left. And I, I think that that's. I'm the only millennial contingency on the show, you know, mm -hmm. and there's the Gen X and then there's the kids. And they, I think what we tried to say, while it's funny and cool and there's action and blood and gore and love and sex and there's all kinds of things in it, like this is the world that we left these kids and what the kids have to do to clean up the mess we made. Mm. And so I, I think that it's really important to ha watch that while you're seeing that to be like, we weren't paying attention, and this is what happened. Now we and we don't it. have a say on it. And yeah. now they get to take the mantle. And, and that's who will. That is who will take the mantle when uh, and if and when this, you know, it all falls apart. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to do our part, too. I feel you. Yeah. Krista, nice to meet Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so much. you. For Krista, I'm DJ. See you next time here on The Sit Down.